first of all, thank you for joining us and joining us over the platform tonight in the whole crowd here this evening. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, but I have to say this is the first time I've actually gotten a thank you gift before speaking. Uh, so, uh, so Inherently very optimistic oh, about your remarks. Uh, so, there's been a lot of ground to cover during the course of the afternoon. Uh, what is your sort of spectrum vision for the next short term, say, four years? arbitrarily in a presidential term. And what are the things that should be happening in the next four years, and what are the things that sort of shouldn't be happening? What are the priorities and sort of the non-priorities? Well, uh, first of all, the priorities should be what Congress tells us the priorities are first and foremost. So that's the first priority. Um, and that, of course, uh, most immediately would be the incentive auction uh, legislation. Uh, so happy to sort of expand upon that if you want to follow the question. Uh, that's a whole other Actually, we could give a whole on that. Um, so, um, I, we obviously need to bring more spectrum to the marketplace. So, uh, auctions, repurposing. Uh, I've been talking for a long time about federal spectrum, and I think the, the value of uh, trying to encourage uh, auctions for exclusive licenses. Uh, I, I made no secret to the fact that I was a bit disappointed with the, the primary emphasis on sharing. Um, while that can be beneficial, and uh, I've been a proponent of sharing in other contexts, such as uh, white spaces, and license use of TV white spaces, um, we need to do more. Um, and uh, so uh, there's, well, there's a lot to talk about there. Do you want to, want to follow up any one of those? But that's, uh, that would be a rough outline uh, over the next either four minutes or four years. What? <laughs> we have 30, so somewhere in the middle. Uh, what should the commission avoid doing? What would be the, the negative possible actions the commission could take that would make it hard the wireless ecosystem? So making it harder for secondary markets. Uh, we want to make sure we are respecting antitrust and competition law, looking out for uh, concentrations of market power, abuses of that power that result in consumer harm. But having said that, we want to allow a uh, spectrum that's already in the market to flow to its highest and best use. Um, and that, I'll put a lot of things, so a lot of secondary tra the market transactions, uh, but also repurposing. So to work with the great alacrity in terms of trying to uh, repurpose uh, spectrum, and, and we have been working on a number of items and uh, issued uh, several in the past couple of years. Um, all while observing the prime directive of the FCC, uh, which is uh, to prevent harmful interference. Um, so uh, that's important. But when we do auction spectrum, or if we do approve transactions, to not impose unnecessary uh, encumbrances upon that spectrum. Um, and I learned in part the hard way and in part the easy way, uh, going back to my own years as commissioner, uh, July of 07, when we voted out the 700 megahertz order, uh, the differences between the success of what happened with the C and the D blocks. Both had uh, a large number of encumbrances placed upon them. Uh, long story short, as a result of that on the C block, we saw smaller entrepreneurs, smaller market players driven out of the market because the C block went for about I think, 77 cents per megahertz pop, compared to the A and B blocks, which went for about 270, cents per megahertz. And so the, the idea, the foundation of that band plan, which was to try to find a home for small, medium, and large players, kind of got flushed down the toilet as a result. So let's avoid that. And then there was the D block. Uh, so that was obviously overly encumbered to the point where nobody uh, gave a credible bid uh, for that. Uh, so uh, that's the number one thing to avoid. But I will continue to be a squeaky wheel that for federal spectrum, it needs to be the highest of priorities emanating from the West Wing of the White House, and I've said this before the election, I would have said it regardless of the outcome of the election, to, um, to, auction, to, to, to uh, provide uh, executive branch agencies with incentives as necessary, that these are old concepts, by the way, of, of uh, giving executive branch agencies uh, financial incentives to yield more spectrum, because right now it's a very opaque process. We have literally uh, nameless and faceless bureaucrats who are uh, coming up with numbers as to how much it costs to relocate those federal users, we have no idea what the cost assumptions are that underlie those numbers, uh, and there's a disincentive. Nobody wants to. Nobody really comes to the FCC or to NDI saying, "Here, I've got all this leftover spectrum. Please get rid of it for me." Right. So, 
So there's a disincentive to come up with a number that makes it uh, economical or legal for a federal user to, to move. Right. Now, there's been some progress on the federal incentive side. There's uh, the CSEA, uh, 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 CSEA originally, and then the, the enhancements that were recently passed that gave more money for planning and that sort of thing in advance. Um, there's OMB Circular 11, which folds into the budgetary process, the cost of spectrum and things like that. There have been other proposals about things like spectrum fees, for example, to be imposed on federal users that I think every administration in the last three or four at least have all proposed as part of their budgets. Um, potentially extending it to federal as well as commercial. What, when you think about incentives for federal users to be more efficient, um, what types of incentives do you think deserve to have that kind of exploration and, and, and how would that look? Well, I, I do think we need to uh, look at what has worked in the past. So if you look at the early part of the last decade, you can find some uh, programs, some of which you cited, uh, and ideas and, and policies that worked. Uh, so as a result, we saw, what, 60 megahertz or so auction in the 700 megahertz uh, auction and uh, 90 in AWS-1. Julie, does that sound right? About, about 150 <laughs> megahertz, yeah. Calling He's, He's checking his black exactly. Sorry, I busted you there. But anyway. He's you're just testing the spectrum availability. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is the reliability of the device. It's working on his fancy football team. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so that yielded 150 megahertz, uh, the two largest spectrum auctions in history. Uh, plus, we've, you know, we've had some sort of garage sale type uh, uh, auctions since then. But um, let's emulate what worked then. Uh, that is uh, to try to adopt a, maybe a cooperative model rather than a coercive model for federal users. Uh, and sure, let's see if we can uh, uh, give them financial incentives. So, you know, if, if sticks aren't working, try carrots. Um, and, but it's got to be a priority at really the highest level of the executive branch. And the executive branch has an advantage over the legislative branch or other you know, independent agencies, et cetera, in that there is one person who embodies the executive branch. And it's a pyramid with one person at the top of it. So uh, it should be easier to get federal users to actually yield spectrum for exclusive use licenses for auctions. Um, sharing can be good, but it's confusing and uh, ill-defined and um, doesn't really solve the challenge. So, you touched on sharing, so why don't we pivot to that next. So, the PCAST report came out. Reactions to PCAST has been talked about a lot, but uh, maybe as your thinking has evolved, how do you sort of place that in the intellectual framework for the next you know, sort of four years of spectrum planning? Sure. So, you know, I want to go out of my way to compliment our friends at NCIA and the folks in the White House who worked very hard on a lot of good ideas, and I don't mean to take away from uh, their thoughtfulness and, and their uh, good faith effort there. Uh, but I think the end result uh, of really stopping short of uh, pushing for auctions uh, is going to prove uh, cumbersome. Uh, so if the, the next uh, best auction we have is the incentive auction, um, uh, I have been a bit pessimistic that's going to yield as much as was hoped for. I hope I'm wrong. This is one, one case where I'm, I really do hope I'm wrong. But I think we need to be prepared for uh, that to not yield as much spectrum, and especially in these larger markets where it's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, 80 megahertz, 60 megahertz, whatever the estimates are, I like to respond by asking, where, where is that going to be? So you mentioned so the PCAST report, and obviously 1755 to 1850 is teed up as part of this ongoing process at the, at the Commerce Department and through the White House. Uh, some of that uh, spectrum, uh, as part of the spectrum act, has, has to be auctioned off in 2015, I think, where we have some deadlines coming up for the commission. So when you think about sort of the decision point that has to be reached with pairing and not pairing and all those things coming up, how, how do you think about the timeline? So you have some 15 some <coughs> spectrum that has to be auctioned by 15. How patient are we about waiting for the federal government to figure out the 1755-1850 process? Um, how important is it to try and get the pairing done so that you 1755 to 1780 is paired with 2155 to 2180? How do you think of any of those six questions I just asked you? <laughs> <laughs> 25 words or less. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So uh, we need to, to uh, work with uh, alacrity, but we want to make sure that uh, we don't get it wrong to be, you know, we don't want to be hasty. Um, so uh, during the course of speak from experience, during the course of the 700 megahertz uh, auction, uh, we actually had industry coming to the commission saying slow down. Right. Uh, but then there were also indications of an economic slowdown. Uh, and so I was actually pushing for 
actually a late 2007 to for you know I guess it was an early 2008 auction. But let's hurry up before something happens to the financial markets. Um, so there are a lot of variables that play. You want it to be quick, but you want it to be good as well. Let's just focus on incentive auctions out of that so flurry of questions you just gave me. Uh, so if we are uh, indeed uh, trying to tackle the most complicated spectrum auction in world history, and that's uh, not an exaggeration, um, do we want it to be a simultaneous auction or sequential? Uh, and uh, Simultaneous to me it does seem like you're moving from 3D chess to playing, or 2D chess to 3D chess to playing that one blindfolded. Um, so, but you know, uh, initial comments are due on December 21st. So please tell me I'm wrong and why that's beneficial and why that will yield more spectrum and meet all the goals at the end. Um, so we want to get that done. Um, we want to get all that done. Uh, you know, we, should we be patient for the executive branch? I guess we have to be. <laughs> There's no other alternative. Um, and uh, we as an independent agency can't make them uh, work any, any faster. Um, but uh, you need to be prepared for the unexpected because there's, there's always that when you're dealing with these things, especially when you're plowing new ground as you will be with incentive auctions in particular. So incentive auctions and the government spectrum are all part of this sort of quest for 500, which we've all been talking about for a long time. How do you feel like we're doing uh, in getting to 500 and uh, what are the roadblocks you see? You've been in the fight a couple, but what, do you, what else do you see out there? Yeah, I, uh, I, I don't think we're doing all that well, uh, and uh, that's going to be frustrating. And, you know, I think uh, we could be here two, four, six, or eight years from now, um, and be very concerned. The, you know, the possible silver lining. I'll, I'll segue at this point into a pitch for uh, policies to. Uh, adopt uh, to create an environment for better spectral efficiency. Um, so uh, that could be the silver lining is that something is produced uh, more as, as a result of uh, perceived spectrum shortages uh, in that regard, new innovations, new investment, et cetera. I think regardless, of, even if we could bring 500 megahertz uh, to market within the next uh, couple of years, uh, you're still going to have to have policies that look at localities. I, I really, I've, I've called for this publicly a couple of times in the past couple of years, which is, the commission really ought to have a summit on spectral efficiency, looking at all angles of what can we do to remove regulatory roadblocks in order to foster that. I mean, here's this is where we are at this point. So, even you know, this I said this when the national broadband plan was was hatched um, that even if everything could be met on the fastest of timetables, it's still the better part of a decade before that spectrum is put into the hands of consumers. So, what do you do in the meantime? Um, and you have to focus on making it easier to develop new technologies and deploy those technologies uh, than to make us more spectrally efficient. Uh, so that's got to be more of the dialogue uh, rather than just what's sharing going to look like. And, you know, these other important questions, uh, in the meantime, consumers are hungry for spectrum, so what can we do to help them? So quickly. And then and to the timing point. So there's been, there in the National Broadband Plan, uh, the chairman put forward, there was a schedule for various things happening. Um, they also called for um, a, a national spectrum plan that would have a sort of a long-term planning document, I think, as part of the Spectrum Policy Task Force. I think Peter, did we call for that too, Peter? Yeah, did we call for one? We called for a long-term spectrum plan. Do you believe there's value in having a plan, a, a five- to ten-year spectrum plan? I know we oppose them in political context, but a five-year plan, uh, a vision of what it looks like, or is that Yes, Chairman Joe. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, is that, does that make sense? And if so, so yeah, no, well, you have to you have to have strategic long-term planning in, in, in any area. I think, but this area, and this isn't, I mean, industrial policy at all. But in, in, because the the government manages the use of the spectrum, uh, you, you have to be doing that because the federal government is by far the largest user of the best spectrum uh, or occupier. I should probably say that the user because we don't know how it's all being uh, used. Um, that uh, we have to have some planning and some incentive, and Congress uh, helps lay out some rules for us there, and we have to do the rest, and uh, the NCI has to do the rest as well. Uh, but you, ha you have to have some planning, and then you have to be able to uh, improvise. Uh, so we were just talking about right before the, the set down here, which is uh, plans are good, um, but you want to uh, be able to uh, throw them away if you have to and, and start all over again. But at least you have a basis or a context, um, a 
basis from which to act or a context within, the, uh, within that improvisation. So the commission were to say three years from now we're auctioning this off and instead of auctioning to be in 16, da -da, and we sort of denounced that and updated regularly or something like that. That has, you think that has value as a, as a good government kind of vehicle? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, certainly the broadband plan was, was a matter of statute that was part of the stimulus bill. Um, but uh, it doesn't hurt, and you know, it was under the Michael Powell SEC as well. You all came up with a plan and a strategy to, to get more spectrum to market, uh, and that produced positive results. So uh, it could be very valuable. Even if, even if you disagree with the ideas, uh, at least I guess the ball rolling starts the conversation and uh, hopefully leads to some sort of action. There's been a lot of talk about. So the commission obviously has a role in making spectrum available through the auction process and what have you, and has a statutory obligation on certain issues. But there are many folks from all uh, from all kinds of divergent positions have come together around the idea of perhaps that the commission should have a less robust role going forward in spectrum management. They should sort of get out of the way. Tom Hazel's talked about this Larry Page. Knowledge. What's your reaction to those calls? And, and do you think that is that the right direction for? government going forward that should sort of pull back a little bit for its, from its centrality in spectrum management? So, and I think as you touched on, is <coughs> these ideas come from across the political spectrum, um, and they come in many different forms. You can say that part of the underpinning of the logic behind unlicensed use of spectrum is get the government out of the way. Um, so that's, uh, that's appealing. And you know, uh, perhaps technology, you know, when the gray hair turns white or whatever, uh, Te maybe technology will squeeze so much efficiency out of the airwaves that uh, there will be less need for this type of regulation. Uh, that, uh, again, the, the prime directive, the, the number one goal is to prevent harmful interference. Uh, how do we go about uh, doing that? So I've never been one to be either jealous of the jurisdiction uh, or to say that the FCC must live forever or that it must live forever in its uh, current form. Um, so let's uh, see where technology uh, competition uh, lead us uh, and see if we need to downsize uh, at some point uh, as a result. Have you, you've been very active internationally, particularly on the Wicked issues lately, but have you seen in your international travels any sort of uh, models of spectrum management that you thought, oh, that, that's interesting, or maybe you guys should try this or try that? Well, the, uh, as a macro matter, what, <laughs> what is a little unsettling is that uh, as an FCC commissioner, when you travel the globe, uh, really all the eyes are on the U.S. Uh, and that you, I'm reminded of this every time I, I travel. Um, and uh, there are you know, teams of people, for instance, at the ITU who do nothing but read all the stuff we write. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not to apply for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Dante wrote about this, didn't <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, So uh, the eyes tend to be on us. Uh, I think you, uh, in hindsight, uh, the way the U.K phased in their digital television transition uh, region by region, uh, which is kind of what we ended up doing uh, as a result of the extension. Uh, it was sort of phased in or rolling. Uh, so that might have been more helpful, uh, you know, 2020 hindsight, sure. not to criticize anyone. Um, and a lot of discussions regarding uh, harmonization in 700 megahertz. Uh, some other countries use it differently. Uh, and uh, so what do we do about that? Those are important ideas. So there's a lot that's aired out at the World Radio Communication Conference or other conferences that I think we need to listen to and, and, and learn from. But um, I think most of that analysis really goes the other way, which is we need to be very careful what we do here, because either the, we can send the wrong wrong signals, uh, or uh, an idea that we figure out too late might be a bad idea gets amplified abroad, people start running with it. Um, so just be careful. And is there any particular example of a careful where you think that maybe we've sent a, a confusing signal? Uh, well, this isn't specifically spectrum, but it may be applied. Yeah, which is the Title II docket. Uh, and uh, I was trying to avoid this because I'm trying to be you know, bipartisan here before the wicket. But uh, <laughs> this uh, comes up in every conversation I have when I travel abroad to talking about the wicket, which is, uh, gee, if the US is seriously contemplating classifying a portion of the internet as a common uh, common carrier. Then, uh, what's wrong with the rest of the world uh, looking at it that way as well? And then, why don't we just uh, bring in uh, the rest of that animal on the whole uh, ecosystem? Uh, so, whether that was the intention or not, uh, doesn't really matter. 
Uh, that's how it's being sold, whether that's cynical or not, that doesn't really matter. Uh, that's what's happening, and uh, so just be careful what you do. So in that same vein, uh, and sticking with her current events, uh, Storm Sandy, the superstorm, created a lot of, of disruption, obviously, and we're all um, thankful for all the first responders and telecommunications companies and electric and power folks who are out there at the front lines restoring service. Are there lessons or regulatory to-dos coming out of the superstorm? Um, there's been talk from various sectors about that. I just wanted to get your views on that particular element, particularly UCB wireless. Well, certainly there's a, there's a lot to learn here, um, as we learned from Katrina and 9-11, um, as to what uh, the private sector's role is, what government's role is, how can we help uh, rebound from these things, uh, natural disasters, and, and, and uh, catastrophes are, are going to happen, um, and we can't always predict how, or where, or when they're going to happen. Um, but, so we need to, I think, learn from it, but I want to caution that we not use it as a pretext uh, to keep more unnecessary regulation in the space, specifically the wireless space. I've seen a lot of press about uh, how, you know, a quarter of the cell towers uh, went down, um, but less press about how quickly they kind of spring back into action, and almost no press about uh, the effects on the wireline network. So the copper network actually uh, was harder hit than anything, and uh, once you flood that with the uh, seawater, uh, it's kind of shot. Uh, so while at our house we have wireline and wireless, we have like redundancy, um, uh, we need to make that sort of part of the conversation. Uh, so that also starts begging the question of, well, fiber actually uh, will hold up much better under such circumstances, so uh, what do we do about replacing uh, copper with fiber? What sort of incentives can we uh, uh, provide for that? So, uh, and I, you know, hearing a conversation also regarding backup power, and uh, again, uh, like with the conversation about what sort of incentives we can we give uh, executive branch uh, users a spectrum to relinquish their spectrum, um, uh, that's a, an older idea, which is, should be revisited, that's fine. But uh, when we talk about backup power, I've, I've seen this movie before, uh, and uh, I think in 08 was when the uh, court held things in abeyance and no one be shot down our last rules in that regard. Um, and here we are four and a half years later, or no, it was November of 08, I guess, so about exactly four years later, uh, we're still having this conversation. I think we need to be very careful. There are a lot of just practical implications. Do you want a thousand gallons of diesel fuel on your roof uh, during a thunderstorm, you know, <laughs> during a lightning storm? So things like that. Um, and, and is there a one-size-fits-all federal rule that applies? Um, so uh, this is complex. Uh, let's not rush to judgment. Let's not uh, rush to deceive a bunch of uh, you know, regulations in this space. Uh, carriers have every incentive mm -hmm. to harden their networks. Uh, and to keep them up and running, uh, or to repair them quickly. Uh, so let's make sure we have an environment that's conducive to that. So one of the themes of the conference is sort of looking back 10 years to spectrum management, and we're gonna open it up to questions after this, so I'll, I'll, a couple of minutes for questions. If you're still away. If you're still, exactly, I, that was my effort to. Um, what, what, exactly, uh, what are the, the key things you draw from the last 10 years? You touched on a couple, but if you want to draw out sort of key... Well, it might seem like 10 years, but I've only been on the commission six and a half. So. <laughs> <laughs> Things happen before my hair was, there, really? was a lot darker, so... What are the things, as you look at the, the, your tenure or before, uh, the, the lessons that can be learned from the last 10 years of spectrum management? And, and sort of as you're, as you look at those who will follow you, uh, this commission in 10 to 20 years from now, what, what are the lessons that they should draw from this period? Uh, light touch regulation. Uh, the wireless sector has been one of the most successful sectors of the US economy ever. Uh, it continues to be so. I, I argue that it's always been uh, and is a world leader. Uh, and uh, we are looked upon by other countries uh, and emulated by them as well. Uh, so flexible use policies, uh, I think uh, that's something we've sort of proven uh, make more sense. Uh, so uh, if you, uh, when the government tries to pick a specific use, uh, maybe a specific technology or type of use uh, of a frequency, uh, and by the time it's actually in the marketplace, that idea might be obsolete. Uh, so let's try to avoid that. Let's look at flexible use policy and, uh, whenever we can. Uh, so just macro level, light touch, and 
that's worked well. So let's think of what works and what's not mess up. Well, I think they discussed a little bit on the last panel, but I'm curious, uh, what, what do you think the lessons are on the licensed versus unlicensed debate or discussion? Well, you know, as I, uh, so early in my tenure in, in 2006, I uh, became a, a loud advocate for unlicensed use of TV white spaces. And um, we have really, you know, we've passed several milestones, 08, 2010, a lot of big quotes, but have yet to really see any devices in the marketplace uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's hard to derive a ton of lessons from that other than it's taken, I think the Powell Commission initiated this discussion in 02, so it's been over 10 years. Right? Um, so uh, I guess it takes a very long time as one lesson, <laughs> uh, and maybe it shouldn't. Uh, we've had some opportunities along the way, I think, uh, to provide us some certainty to actually get these things in aid. Uh, but um, I think unlicensed can be very valuable, uh, as we're seeing with the amount of uh, traffic that's going over Wi-Fi networks right now. Um, I think it provides positive and constructive disruption in the marketplace. I think it uh, is a, a bit of a cure-all, strong term, but uh, for concerns regarding anti-competitive conduct in the marketplace. Um, but I also think that we need exclusive use licenses. You need the build out of infrastructure. The history has proven time and time again. The best way to do that is with auctions, uh, licenses that are, that are auctioned. Um, and uh, that unlicensed should be used for more low power type scenarios uh, for offloading, uh, for the most part. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, you need the mix of the two, um, but uh, let's make sure we're, we're doing that the right way. Great. Let's open it up for one or two quick questions before we and just want you to identify yourself as I call on folks. I'm getting uh, written. Oh, uh, written. I know this is from an anonymous. From the web. Not to research yeah, right. handwriting, which could be a challenge. Yeah, well, that'd be great for us if they could do that. <laughs> yeah, instead of auctions, what will be done to prevent incumbents, which already hold ample spectrum, from using preemptive bids to foreclose competition? I don't know, why don't you put that in your comments? So <laughs> Someone can file that answer for me on December 21st, or February 26th, I think. Uh, so, no, not to be flippant, but, um, uh, I, you know, there, this just reminds me of we have the uh, spectrum aggregation item uh, as well. Uh, you know, curious coincidence that it would be a contemporaneous <laughs> uh, um, item. So, uh, I think we need to be careful of going back to the hard spectrum cap days. Uh, spectrum is a lot like real estate, as I've said time and time again. Each, each transaction is unique and needs to be analyzed uh, for its own unique characteristics. Uh, but uh, so going forward, I will be skeptical of hard caps or things that might not be called caps but really are functionally. Call them sombreros, berets, all materials. But um, uh, so let's just be careful. We don't want anything uh, too inflexible. Uh, you need to be flexible in the space while being mindful of uh, concentrations of market power, abuse of that power that results in consumer harm. Excellent. Another question? Uh, yeah, you can make. Maybe not. Probably project. Uh, I'm going to state your in, uh, one other statement that you made in your initial discourse. Uh, you said the sharing technologies are unproven, and uh, so we need to... Not the technologies necessarily, I mean there's technologies that aren't invented, but that, that we don't know, it's ill-defined I think is what I said, in terms of the policies and, and what PCAST is pushing, there's a lot of, there are a lot of ideas in there, they're all ill-defined, so the concept is ill-defined. So if, if that is the case, is, is it likely that FCC as a regulatory body is taking off the table the notion of shared user spectrum and either likely licensed or unlicensed model of uh, regulation and how to make that available in the marketplace uh, in the near term? Is that a very long term uh, option that you're looking at or it's completely off the table as you go forward and only reallocation is the thing that you're looking for in the short term? Uh, so. The FCC is not uh, putting anything on or off the the table regarding uh, sharing. So that's you know PCAST, that's the executive branch. So they're sorting that out. We certainly have a role, uh, but uh, they are the ones that have to define those federal users of spectrum, executive branch users. They have to define what that means. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, one final question. Yeah. Go ahead. Andrew Barr, my space alliance. I just wanted to ask uh, the commissioner, but, well, thank you for coming first. But, but, um, the question I was curious about is the House uh, Working Group on Spectrum, and, and generally speaking, what happens in 112 if um, uh, the, the jobs bill nightmare sort of comes back and, and the House starts coming to you and talking to you about the incentive options and what, how, how does the commission, you know, take care of that if those kind of politics start rearing in our well, That was to run. So, uh, I thought I'd wake everybody up. We're an independent agency. Uh, Ms. Davey always here for a second. Uh, we're overseen by Congress, the directly elected representatives of the American people. Uh, so what they have to say is very important. Um, but the best way for them to express what it is they want done is to pass legislation and have the president sign it into law. So that was done, uh, and thus far we are executing our mandate uh, through our notice of proposed rulemaking and the incentive auction that we're proceeding. Um, it, it, I'm sure there will be lots of discussions and letters uh, from Congress trying to shake our proceeding, and that has never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> but how would I do it? <laughs> so I'm being flippant, but it's, it's important, um, and uh, we will do our best to, uh, at least I will, I'll do my best to try to faithfully implement Congress's intent. Thank you.